everyone. Welcome to episode 187 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We have a new Patreon to thank. Yes, we want to thank Karen for joining our Patreon community. We appreciate your support so much, Karen. We really do. And Karen became an annual member, which is a new opportunity we're providing through Patreon where you can be a member via a monthly donation or an annual donation. Yep. And we have cool swag. We do. We have everything from bookmarks to pens to bags to notepads, sticky notes, all that good stuff. Yeah. So check us out. The links are in the show notes. Yes. And we want to remind people that it's Scarlet Summer here at the Book Cougars. Yes. We are going to be starting a read along of our second book. Hester by Lori Lico Albanez. Yeah. So we hope you'll join us with that. We won't be having an actual read along Zoom discussion of it, but we'll be discussing it on the episode and we'll be talking with Lori on an episode. She'll be a guest. And then, of course, we have the Goodreads discussion page, social media. Send us an email if you prefer to, you know, not be public about your comments, whatever you prefer. Yeah, we hope you read along. We also have been told by several people that the audiobook is fantastic. So we plan to do both. Yeah, can't wait. Please join us. I have a little bit of sad news to share in that uh, the Savoy Bookshop and Cafe is closing in Westerly, Rhode Island. Their last day will be this Friday, which is before this podcast airs. But, you know, we love that shop so much. We were lucky enough to attend the grand opening years ago. And it's just always sad when any bookstore closes. But when it's one that you've shopped at and have enjoyed, it's especially sad. Yeah, and we've gone to some really great book events there as well. So it's, you I'm know sad what? about that. Yeah, it's where we met Minjin Lee. Yeah. I think there were like six people yeah. there for that event uh, when Pachinko first came out. And I think three of the people were employees. Yeah. Um, so that is a really great memory. Yeah. 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 It'll be missed. It's the same ownership owns Bank Square Books and Mystic. So, you know, we'll still be able to shop there, which I'm glad about, but I will definitely miss Savoy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading a book about a piece of punctuation. Not something I ever thought I would do. I'm reading Semicolon, The Past, Present, and Future of a Misunderstood Mark by Cecilia Watson. I saw this book at some bookstores. This is a library copy that I requested it's really entertaining so far. The semicolon is misunderstood by me personally and many other people. Sometimes I feel like I'm using it correctly, sometimes not. Therefore, I don't use it a lot. So I'm hoping that this book will give me confidence to use it more readily. It's a bit of a biography as well of the semicolon. Chapter one is called Deep History, The Birth of the Semicolon. And the first sentence is, the semicolon was born in Venice in 1494. Mm. So um, then she goes on to talk about the Italian humanists who were hugely influential in early printing and how punctuation wasn't a thing back then in the printing world. And marks were being developed all the time. So you don't really think about that. Yeah. You know, as somebody who's alive in the 20th, 21st century we take these things for granted. And some people are very anal about how marks should be used. But people who studied these things know that there are thousands of different grammar books out there with different rules. Right. One of the reasons English has been so popular and has survived and grown is that it's changed. Back in Shakespeare's day, you chose how you wanted to use a mark. You know, you had your own personal style. And it's funny because I was thinking about when I used to teach and students would ask about punctuation because I would like point out punctuation in their papers and they would often ask, well, what do you do when it's a test that you're writing in class and you don't know the rules? Because sometimes people would just be scattershot. Well, maybe this is right. Maybe that's right. I would just tell them, just be consistent and however you do it. Because then whoever's reading your essay will know that you're consistent and not just sloppy 
or doing the slapdash kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Lucky guess. You know, because I remember when I was in grade school and I couldn't spell a word, I would just write that word really sloppily and just hope the teacher <laughs> thought that I was spelling it correctly. Right. Like no one ever thought of that before. <laughs> so anyway, this is really fun so far. It has a really nice, colorful cover as well. Semicolon by Cecilia Watson. I love the idea of that. I'm a huge fan of the semicolon, but I often don't know if I'm using it correctly. I do, however, enjoy using it. But often if I freak out, like, oh, did I not use it right? I just use a comma. Right. You know? Yeah. It's the cop out. The comma as <laughs> cop out. <laughs> well, you know, we'll have to develop our own book, Cougar Style Sheet, and how we use the semicolon once we have a meeting about it. Okay, we'll release it to the public when we're ready. Sounds good. <laughs> Well, I'm reading The Quickening, Creation and Community at the Ends of the Earth by Elizabeth Rush. Elizabeth Rush was the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for her book, Rising, Still Lifes from a Vanishing City. And that book was about people whose lives and livelihood are threatened by rising sea levels. In this book, The Quickening, she's setting off for the Thwaites Glacier. She was invited to go on this expedition on a ship that literally can break through ice to get to the Thwaites Glacier to study it because climatologists think what happens with that glacier is going to largely determine what happens with sea level rise in the future. The book is called The Quickening because she is thinking about becoming pregnant. And quickening is a term used when you feel your baby move inside of you for the first time. You also can think of that word as things are happening more quickly, like water is running more quickly, things are changing more quickly. And so she overlays the concept of getting pregnant and deciding to have a baby with what's happening in the world today as far as our climate is concerned. Do I want to bring a child into the world? Mm Mm-hmm. She's invited to go on this expedition with people who are studying what's happening around Thwaites Glacier in lots of different ways. Some people are studying the wildlife, like the seals there. Some are putting one of those little submarines that goes underwater and actually trying to send it under the glacier to see what's happening there. So it's quite a cast of characters that are on this ship with her. The front of the book is a list of them and what their jobs are from the people who are crew to the scientists. And then as she's telling her story, which is very memoir-esque, she's also interviewing them and has little pieces and little snippets about them in it. I'm really enjoying it. It may sound like doom and gloom, but it's not. I saw some interview that she did where she said her last book, Rising, was quite sad, but she feels like this one is hopeful. So again, this is called The Quickening, Creation and Community at the Ends of the Earth by Elizabeth Rush. This is from Milkweed Editions and publishes on August 15th. Nice. Does she have actual shipboard discussion on there, like what it's like to live aboard ship? Oh, yes. And the preparation. And one of the opening parts of the book is they're getting through this very difficult passage where the ship is just swaying. I mean, literally rocking back and forth from side to side and everyone's just sick. And she didn't get sick. For some people, they literally just have to go to bed and be in bed for a week while they get through this. It's very alive, that part. And the clothing you have to pack because it's freezing there. Yeah. So, yeah, she goes into all those details. It's very cool. Very cool. I might have to borrow that. Yeah, Yeah. I'm enjoying it. I am reading both of these inspired by my friend Emily. I picked up copies of How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope, and then The Path to Kindness, Poems of Connection and Joy. These are both edited by James Cruz. And I'm enjoying them immensely, very I much. Love those books. And I love that it has the little French flaps, as they're called, you mm-hmm. know, that you can use as a bookmark. So I'm just carrying them around. They've been with me in bed and at my desk and on the back porch, enjoying them very much. So thank you so much for discovering them. Oh, my pleasure. And it's such a great way to consume poetry because it's filled with all different poets. So you're not just getting one collection with one poet. And they're so small that they're not hard to carry around and set about. Exactly. Know? Yeah, they would they would fit into a fairly small purse. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, yay. 
So Emily, what have you just read? I just finished The Breakaway by Jennifer Weiner. This book publishes on August 29th. She is known as like the queen of the beach read, even though her books come out in August. I guess people are still on vacation at the end of August. Um, The main character of this book is Abby and she's fat. One of the things that Jennifer really believes in is having characters in her books that look like her. And she felt like when she was a kid, there were never characters that had what she calls, quote, real bodies like hers. So Abby is a fat 30 year old finding her way in Philadelphia She loves to ride her bike. The opening scene of this book is about a young girl riding her bike, and you can really feel the joy that it brings to her, the freedom. And if you follow Jennifer on social media, particularly on Instagram, she is a huge bicyclist. And last year for her book, she biked to a lot of her book events, and you could follow along with her, which was really fun. And she was also doing research for this book that is about a bike trip. So that was pretty cool. This young woman, Abby, in this book is offered an opportunity to lead a group of people on a bike tour. She isn't your classic, what you might picture the leader of a bike tour to look like, but she's very capable and does a good job. It's somewhat predictable, but I enjoyed that because I was reading it alongside the Scarlet Letter, which was difficult to read as we've talked about. So it was kind of my palate cleanser in between my Scarlet Letter chapters. And there's a love story in it. There's also a thread about abortion And Jennifer Weiner is also an author that is very political on her social media and has two young teenage daughters and feels very strongly about what's happening to women's rights in this country. So she really took that on in this book. And there's a character that is pregnant and needs to find some solutions for that. So trigger warning for people if that's something that you don't want to read about. You might want to skip this novel. But I really enjoyed it. It was easy, quick read, but also with some heart and trying to make a point about what's going on for women in the United States. Again, that's called The Breakaway by Jennifer Weiner, and it's out on August 29th. Nice. Well, I had a palate cleanser of a novel that really swept away any residual Ulysses baggage that I had. In (laughs) fact, we were at McNally Jackson last night, the one near Rockefeller Center, and I saw copies of Ulysses and it actually made me happy to see them. And, you know, like, (laughs) oh, good. But anyway, the book that I'm talking about is How Can I Help You by Laura Sims. And I love this book so much. Thank you to Putnam's for sending us review copies. It is a short but really powerful mystery thriller novel, suspense, you know, all of those categories, right? It's about two women who are working in a library. One of them has been there for two years. She's working circulation. The other woman is the brand new reference librarian straight out of library school. She's a bit of a failed writer is how she's presented, frustrated writer. She was most recently living in Chicago and she left her boyfriend for this job, which is in a smaller town. And she really doesn't want to be there. The other woman working the circulation desk is there because she has run away from her past life where she was a nurse who did things. That's not much of a spoiler because that's on the book jacket. This is one of those books that it's hard to talk about because you don't want to give anyone any spoilers. One of the people who blurbed it said that it's a descent into jolly madness. And I love that description for this. And Sims herself is a reference librarian in a library. And she sets up author events or speaker events and events like that. So she also in this novel gets that new employee vibe down, like from the new employees perspective and from the existing employees perspective, which is a lot of fun because these two women are looking at each other from across the library And obsession sets in. Mm. Yeah. And what's really cool is one of Shirley Jackson's novels plays a role. It's not just mentioned. There's a little bit more to it. I looked at a couple reviews that mention that Laura Sims is a bit like Shirley Jackson in that vein, which I would agree 
But then there's also a substantial Shirley Jackson within the novel. There's also this really cool part talking about what reading does to you. Like when you're really into a book and then you have to go to work yeah. and nothing seems real. Like your colleagues all seem flat and you just want to get away from them <laughs> and get back to your book, right? Yeah. Even though you may love them. I appreciated that. So if you were looking for a real page turner, a short mystery thriller suspense novel, I just adore this one so much. How Can I Help You by Laura Sims. Really a great read. Well, also, aren't you always looking for that book that keeps you up at night and you can't put it down? Mm -hmm. It sounds like she, as a librarian, she understands that. And as an author, she created it. Yeah. So cool. Oh, it's so, it's such a good novel. I mean, and there, there are scenes of what librarians have to deal with certain types of patrons and issues like that as well. And I read it in two sittings. Mm. So it was really, really a fast read. Yeah. I finished Come With Me by Aaron Flanagan. This book publishes on August 22nd. It's told from two main points of view, Gwen and Nikki. Kind of ironic segue for you talking to a descent into madness and kind of trying to run away from your life. Maybe this book has a similar theme but I don't want to give anything away that two characters originally met in college as college interns for a company. And then Gwen goes off and moves out of state, gets married, has a child, is a stay at home mother. And then something happens to her husband and she's left on her own to raise her child. Nikki was the other person who was an intern and she is now the COO of this company that they had interned at. And when Gwen seeks to go back home, which is to Dayton, Ohio, she reaches out to Nikki and Nikki takes her under her wing and gives her a job back at this company, which seems like a lovely thing. And then her friendship starts to feel a little smothering mm -hmm. and she starts to become one of those friends that maybe is a little scary. <laughs> So it takes on some really interesting themes, one of which is to be someone who's in a life, living a life, and everything changes overnight. And also when people aren't who you think they are, which is one of my like constants in life that I believe very strongly and have experienced myself. So when I read it in a novel, there's something that like scratches an itch that I enjoy, but also is so incredibly disturbing. And I feel like Aaron Flanagan did that so well in this novel because you just, you just feel it happening, but you also can see how it can be hard to get unentangled from somebody you're entangled with, particularly if they've done you favors and helped improve your life. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens with this, but there's also a character who's, come from hard circumstances. And so that's part of why she's developed the strategies she has in her life. And we see that start to unravel. So you understand why someone turns out the way they do. Interesting. I'm yeah. trying to be vague enough yes. <laughs> to not ruin this. <laughs> and the other thing that I think Flanagan does really well in this story is character that's a bad mom, which is a hard thing to write. Because people have really strong feelings about that. Yeah. She does that really well here. And it's really sad and believable. Again, this is called Come With Me by Aaron Flanagan. It spans from 2012 to 2023. So there's a hint of the pandemic, but just a hint. Don't let that make you not pick this book up. Come With Me, Aaron Flanagan, out 822. I was supposed to be going to an event at Bank Square Books to see the author of Lightkeeper's Daughter. I didn't make it because a big storm happened. I left our neck of the woods in Guilford, was driving that way, and I stopped in Old Saybrook at the library. And you, Emily, texted me and said, wow, a huge storm just broke out. Anyway, long story short, I didn't go to Bank Square Books. I just stayed put at the Old Saybrook Library which left me time to browse in ways that I haven't browsed there before. I looked at their local author section, which was a lot of fun. The woman who wrote Hunger Games is the local author. Never knew that. And then I discovered that they have there an Anne Petrie collection. And it's its own bookshelf with two or three shelves. And they have a photo of her, of Anne Petrie. And then they have a photo of her aunt, 
Anna James as well. And it's all of the books that they have that are related to them, about them, by them type of thing. So Anna James, she's the woman who ran the James Pharmacy, who owned and ran the James Pharmacy in Old Saybrook that we've mentioned in the past. We've done a biblio adventure there. The building still exists. One of the books that I pulled from the shelf and ended up reading, it was a very short book. It's called What Did It Take? A True Story. It's by Whitney McKendry Moore. And this is about Anna Louise James, Anne Petrie's aunt, who was such a big inspiration for her. And it gave a little bit of family history, which I thought was interesting. This book starts with Willis Samuel James, who would be Anne Petrie's grandfather, who escaped slavery in the 1860s. He had grown up in a plantation in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And at 16, he escaped and he became a water carrier for the Union Army, eventually made it to New York, Westchester County. He got married there and he and his wife moved to Hartford. He was the coachman for Marshall Jewell, who eventually became the governor of Connecticut and then was later the ambassador to Russia, which is so interesting. It's also interesting is that Willis Samuel James had three wives, all of whom were named Anna. Oh, isn't that weird? That is weird. Yeah. So curious. This is so hard to talk about. But so Anna Houston James is the pharmacist. Uh, she was born to the second wife and had a pretty decent life until her mom died. And then some years later, the dad remarried a woman who was very demanding and got to the point where Anna even quit school to help with chores around the house, even though they already had a maid. Mm. And she was the youngest sibling, and the older siblings were really concerned about all of this. Anna eventually runs away from home in Hartford and ends up in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, where her older sister is living with her husband. Peter Lane is his name. And he worked in a pharmacy and owned a pharmacy then himself. So he was the inspiration for Anna to become a pharmacist. And that sister and Lane are the parents of Anne Petrie. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If that made sense to everybody, I I hope it did. And if it didn't, we'll draw a diagram. Or get the book. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. So I just think that background is really fascinating because... We're going to be talking about one of Anne Petrie's books later in this episode. But just to know that was her grandfather escaped from slavery. Yeah. And then there she is writing about Harlem in the 1940s. I think it is just stunning to think of how little time has actually passed. Yeah. 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 So this is an interesting book. I mean, it's sketchy. There's not a lot of information about Anna James other than what's on the public record. Her papers are at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. But as far as the author said, there's not a lot of personal reflection in the papers. It's very much just factual. I was really happy to get a little bit of a idea of the family that Anne Petrie came from and to learn more about Anna James, who went by her middle name with the family. Louise is what they called her. Well, because there were so many Annas. Oh, my God. So many Annas. Because <laughs> yeah. they named... I mean, if I followed the story correctly, the parents named her after the mother sounds like it right yeah i mean as if he had you know marrying three annas isn't enough they're going to name one of their children that right and then the sister names the daughter Anne. Anne. yeah right oh and this is interesting too anna louise james that is her name apparently but on her birth certificate she was born in 1886 her birth certificate says louise claget james oh so i'm not sure where the name change happened or or what went on there. But Anne Petrie had a daughter and this author is able to interview her. People wondered, like, why did Anne Petrie move back to Old Saybrook? It's a very white community. Petrie was African-American. What was the draw? And her daughter says that it was because her mother's aunt was there and she was such an important woman in her life. She says, mother returned to the orbit of this remarkable woman, Mm. right? I mean, and it's family. Like, why do people move? You know, sometimes they move back to be with family. So really short book, but some really nice information. James also had a second pharmacy in Old Lyme, Connecticut, 
that her brother Fritz ran for her. Hmm. So amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad that I got waylaid there by the storm (laughs) to read this short biography. What did it take? A true story by Whitney McKendry Moore, a biography of Anna Louise James. Well, I'm going to go witchy on us now in honor of Scarlet Summer. I finished We Ride Upon Sticks by Quan Berry. This novel it takes place in Danvers, Mass., which was the home to the Salem Witch Trials in 1692, 300 years prior to when this book takes place, which is 1989. If you were raised in the 80s, you will love love, love this book. There are so many references and so much popular culture and music and all sorts of things from that time period. This book also had so many characters. It made my brain explode. (laughs) One of the characters is Abby Putnam, who is a direct descendant of the accusers during the trials. Because what happened in Danvers was there was a group of teenagers who started accusing people of being witches, male, female. They were not discerning. (laughs) I was really struggling with this book, but I wanted to read it because it's witchy, you know, and Mm -hmm. we're going to Salem. And I wanted to hear about that. You know, like I wanted to read the modern day, not interpretation, but something that was witchy. Finally, I got the audio book changed everything. Nice. Yeah, totally changed everything. And it's narrated by Isabel Keating, who does a fantastic job. In the front of the book, she has a very cute map that helps you understand where Danvers is in relation to Salem, because it used to be considered more a part of Salem than it is now. But it is where the witch trials took place. And then there's a huge character map that shows all of the players on this field hockey team, which is what the book is about is this field hockey team who in summer when they're doing their getting in shape two a days at a camp they get an Emilio Estevez journal who if you were a fan of movies in the 80s you know who Emilio Estevez is he was part of the Brat Pack that included Molly Ringwald and people like that they kind of use that journal as their place where they put their dreams and wishes or, you know, spells, if you want to think of it that way. And they tear apart a tube sock, a blue tube sock, and tie strings around their arms. And then they are somehow able to communicate with each other without actually having to use their voices. Hmm. Things ensue, as you might imagine. They were a very losing team. They begin to win. But again, it was really hard. And part of it is what Quan Berry does in this novel. Each chapter is loosely about one of the characters. But every character appears over and over and over again. And she uses their first and last names, their parents, their siblings. My mind was exploding. But somehow when I read it whilst listening to the audiobook or just listened to the audiobook, it all clicked into place for me. Mm. There's something auditorial about names that works better for me than reading them, I guess. And it's irreverent. It's laugh out loud, funny. And again, very 80s. A lot of detail, though, a lot. And that's the part I struggled with. Okay, so nice. Well, I have that one on hold at the library. And I think I might do the audio thing too, if I decide to go with it. I didn't mention that I did start Stacey Schiff's Witches. Mm. But I'm really at the tippy beginning, you know. Um, But Women, men, and dogs were executed as being witches. Wow. So yeah, that's a conversation for another day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of them are mentioned in this book. We Ride Upon Sticks, Quan Berry, and then also narrated by Isabel Keating, the audiobook. Right. Biblio Adventures. Yes, we joint jaunted. We've been joint jaunting this last week, including yes. going to the Vintage Book Club. Yes, we met this time at Red Heat Tavern in South Windsor. This is a book club that I facilitated, hosted by Book Club on the Go. Our friend Cindy runs that business. And Red Heat Tavern does such a nice job. They have a private meeting room in the back. So they always set that up for us. And it's a very lovely air conditioned space where we can have a great club. And there were like 13 of us this time. So it was a good turnout. And we discussed The Street by Anne Petrie. 
And this was my first reading of it. It's Chris has read it before. It was one of her favorite reads of 2019. This book was published in 1946 originally. And Mariner is putting out all four of her novels. One of them is a book of short stories. Yeah, her adult fiction. Right. I guess that's a good way to say yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, with beautiful covers. This new edition of The Street has an intro by the author Tayari Jones, which I started to read before I started reading the book. And then I heard Chris's little voice in my head saying, read the introduction after you read the book. So I did go back and read it after. And this book is about Ludi and her son, Bub. Ludi is working for a family in Old Saybrook. She has to travel, be away from her family. She travels back to see them occasionally on weekends because her son and her husband are living in the Bronx. Yeah, so the husband can't find a job anywhere, and he's been trying. They married very young at the opening of the book. Ludi's 19, I believe, and her son is two. Right. And so she takes this job for a white family in Old Saybrook, She's trying really hard to save money. And the woman she's working for even says at one point, maybe it's better that you go once a month instead of every To see every her week. family because yeah. the travel costs are costs. high for yeah. her. It's exactly. Like $6. And, and yeah. it would just be for the day pretty mm-hmm. much, right? Right. Yeah. So the marriage falls apart and she's a single mom trying to make it on her own. You know, Ben Franklin and his ideas of being able to make it that if he could rise from his humble beginnings to be where he was, she could just work harder. The white family that she works for, they're making money hand over fist. And it's really fascinating because they own a paper making company is how that family got their money. And there's paper in Harlem that's blowing around. Yeah. That's garbage mm-hmm. and sticking onto people and things like that. So the first time I read it was with an e-reader and the second time This time I I did the audio, which was fantastic. I listened to the version by Danielle Detweiler. Wonderful narration. I did the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was just struck by the dichotomies that Anne Petrie has within the novel. Not just black, white, but things like paper. A fascinating and tight book when you really dig in and start looking at it. I mean, the story itself is really compelling. Yeah. So Ludi ends up a single mom. She goes to look for an apartment for she and Bub to live in. She had been living with her father and her, I'm not sure if it was her stepmother or his lover. And she finds this apartment that she can rent on the street. That's the title of the book, which is 116th street in Harlem in New York. One of the scenes where she's going to look at this apartment, it's so foreshadowing once you get to the end of the book, but she's walking ahead of the super of the building who's showing her the apartment. And you can just feel her discomfort at just the position she's in of being followed so closely behind by this man alone. And who she's gotten creepy vibes off of. In the building itself, it's as you go upstairs everything gets narrower and narrower and darker and darker. And that's kind of heavy Gothic element, but there are Gothic elements all throughout this novel as well from the humans looking like animals and being described as different types of animals from snakes to pigs Mm -hmm. that I didn't pick up that much the first time around. But I mean, it's really obvious when you're reading it like snake eyes and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So Ludie's just trying to make a go of it and keep her son on track and in school and out of trouble and has to leave him home alone in order to try to make a living. Over and over again, she's just trying to make a living and things are getting in her way. And part of what gets in her way is that she's a beautiful, very young woman. Right. Very young. And it's really sad. And I don't want to give too many spoilers, but... If you read it very carefully in the beginning, you know that it's not going to be a happy ending. But yeah, let's talk about the ending. I mean, one thing about this novel that makes it a great choice for a book club is that it has an ambiguous ending. Yeah, it's really an open ending is how I was thinking of it. Yeah. And so in my mind, when that happens, I start to create all of the different options of what I think might have happened. I know some people hate that. They want like, tell us what happened. 
Like, I don't want to be wondering about what might have happened to these characters. But it does create great fodder for your book club. Absolutely, it does. <laughs> I mark some of the things. These are still my notes from when I read it as an e-reader. You know, I do highlights and then I print out the notes. But I was struck by Ludi talking at one point about how when you look at different things through different frameworks, you understand situations differently. And I was just like, wow, CRT, critical race theory, you know, because that's exactly what this is. She says, if you looked at them from inside the framework of a fat weekly salary and you thought of colored people as naturally criminal, then you didn't really see what any Negro looked like. You couldn't because the Negro was never an individual. He was a threat or an animal or a curse or a blight or a joke. And just talking, I was just like, wow, this is published in 1946. It's something that's been on people's mind who study human behavior and who study different groups for a long time. Yeah. And I think a lot of white people's eyes have just been opened in more recent years because of national events and the ongoing fear that people have about CRT. Mm -hmm. It might have been Terry Eagleton who said that if you're opposed to theory, basically, it's because you don't acknowledge your own. Mm. So again, this novel is set during World War II and men are still being recruited or drafted, I should say. They're not just being recruited, they're being drafted. And one of the characters who avoided being drafted says to another character, don't talk to me about Germans. They're only doing the same things in Europe that's been done in this country since the time it started. And he's referring to slavery. And Emily and I have been talking about this because we read something recently that talked about how the Nazis got a lot of their ideas from America, from the United States, and how, uh, particularly in the South, Jim Crow worked. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's such a brilliant novel, yeah. but it has so much embedded in it as well if you want to do a deep dive or if you just want to read the story about this struggling black woman, single mom. Right. And it has a lot to do with money. And that's some of what the quotes you're just reading and having just finished Killers of the Flower Moon and Devil in the Grove, actually, you know, I've been thinking a lot about inherited wealth and how that gets disrupted, or these folks never had the opportunity for it. And it affects generations upon generation upon generation. Yeah, you know, right. And that's something that you really feel when you're reading the street as well. Yeah. So highly, highly recommend this novel. We're going to be reading Anne Petrie all year. The next Vintage Book Club is October 19th, where we're going to be reading her book, Country Place. This is a book club that takes place in person. Uh, the next one will be at Wood Memorial Library yep. in, in South, South Windsor. Windsor. Yeah. We'd love for you to join us. It's a compelling group of people. Good conversation. I'm so thankful to Chris for introducing me to this author, Anne Petrie. Absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm so happy and in awe of the group itself because, you know, we started as a Willa Cather book club. And when we got through all of her novels, people still wanted to stay together and discuss other authors. And so here we are now on our second, well, our third author. So it was Cather and then four novels by John Steinbeck, technically five, because we did two in one month, because right. we meet quarterly and now Anne Petrie. So super excited to read more of her work. I did read Country Place and it's set in what is probably Old Saybrook. Yeah. So... We're also just back, just back. It was yesterday. It feels like we're just back. We just stepped off the train from New York City. We spent the entire day there yesterday. Listeners who've been around for a while know that Chris was just in library school. She graduated. Woo, woo. And she did a lot of archival research when she was in library school, is still doing it. I participated by going to libraries with her and sitting on the other side of doors when she would go into like these mysterious rooms. And we are doing a little research for a potential upcoming read along for the book Cougars. So we went yesterday to the Grolier Club, which is the oldest bibliophile organization in North America. It was started in 1884 and is still going strong. Their collections are really heavy on book collectors 
and bookseller catalogs. We're talking antiquarian rare booksellers. They had this one where we were on the third floor where the library is. They had two walls full of books about libraries. You know, and I spotted the one about what a library means to a woman, you know, the book about Edith Wharton's library and just some other classics. But the library is not open to the public. So you do have to make a research appointment. But you can visit their exhibits on the first floor. And they have a tremendous one going on right now that is called A Century of Dining Out. Unfortunately, it closes on July 29th. So this episode will be airing a couple days after that. But it was all about menus from early America up until more contemporary times. It was fascinating to see like the desserts. Yeah, like, that's one thing that we kind of focused in on when desserts started to be offering. Emily noticed it was mainly a fruit and nuts, lots of fruits and nuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, you see ice cream introduced and cakes and things like that. I mean, of course, the design of the menus was really interesting to see they were beautiful. At one point, they introduced these menus on lace that was imported. And they said that that was also at the time when Valentine Day cards were of the same style. Yeah. You know, those lace Valentine Day cards. Mimicking that. And there was yeah. one too that was done for an organization just after the Civil War. The menu was inside this little backpack replica of the packs that Union soldiers carried with their blanket roll and everything. So really unique items, obviously. Yeah. So neat to see. And just to see what people were eating yes. back then. There were a couple of things I didn't know what it was. Yeah, I had that also. And then there were spellings that were different. I mean, I was fascinated by the fact that many menus called eggplant, capital E-G-G, capital P-L-A-N-T. It was two different words, right. which we don't do now. Yeah, now it's one word generally. Yeah. yeah. So that made us very hungry. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I look forward to seeing what their next public exhibit will be. Yeah. Um, but Scott, the librarian, was really just great and so helpful and friendly with yeah. us there. We had requested 10 boxes of materials and we managed to get through all 10 boxes. We did. And I now have a greater appreciation of how hard it is to do work like that. I mean, you think like, oh, I'm just going to sit in a chair and look at papers all day. It was exhausting. Yes, yes. <laughs> you have to use your brain, people, all day long. Yeah. You know, what's fascinating, I think, with archival work is that you're going there usually with something in mind, mm -hmm. right? But then you're looking at all of these papers and photos and other types of ephemera that just spark your imagination and you start making connections in your head between other things you saw in the collection and other things you know about these people or how that connects to different writers. And it is exhausting. Yeah. It is so exciting. Yeah. But man, when we walked out of there, we felt like we'd been through it. Yeah. And Chris was funny because at one point I gasped because I found something that I had I really set off looking for some very specific things. I think you were trying to connect the dots like that. I was like, I'm on a mission to find these things. And we were looking through address books. And at one point I turned to a certain page and a business card for someone who I'm looking for was right there. And I gasped yes. and Chris turned to me and she said, you're sold on archival research, aren't you? <laughs> you know, and she just raised her eyebrows and I was like, oh my God, it's like a little scavenger hunt, yes, you know? Yeah, so, yeah totally. It was really fun. Yeah. And, and I mean, this research relates a little bit to my woman booksellers project that is ongoing for me. Yeah. But it was just a great day. And I'm so happy you got to experience some archival research. Yes, I got in on the inner sanctum. Thanks to you. Thank oh, you. So. And we ate well. We went across the street from the girl year was a great sandwich shop called Antico Vinal. And we got a giant sandwich. Thankfully, Scott, the librarian, had let us know that they're huge sandwiches. So we split it. They have fresh, huge pieces of focaccia bread coming out of the oven constantly. And they slice into these big squares and you can fill it with whatever you want. And Chris had to laugh. Oh, my gosh. So in upcoming reads, I'll be talking about The Divine Comedy by Dante. And he's everywhere. Ever since I've decided to read it, I'm stumbling across him left and right. On their menu, they have a La Dante sandwich, La Inferno sandwich, and a La Paradiso sandwich. <laughs> and I was just like, no way, no way. <laughs> 
So that was a delicious sandwich. It was delicious. And it gave us the strength to go back. Because I think actually in the morning after we had seen the exhibits and then tackled the first box, we realized we needed to get going. So we had lunch and then we both started each looking through a box. So it got us through the rest of the day. And then we packed up because the Grolier closes at five, went down to the Rockefeller Center and went shopping in the new McNally Jackson's, which Chris had been to. I hadn't had the chance to be there. Beautiful store. Yeah. Oh my gosh. McNally Jackson is the one that is the bookstore we've talked about in the past that has sections of the store devoted to different countries, which is kind of unusual. It's the literature of different countries in their original languages quite often. Had a great browse. We dried off a little bit because there had been a raging surprise thunderstorm. Yeah. Hadn't brought our raincoats because it was supposed to be sunny all day. Yes. And then we hopped the train home. I fell fast asleep on the train, (laughs) dropped my book. Chris was laughing when I woke up. It's hard work being an archivist. (laughs) Yeah. So that was another early day. We left the house at 645 and and got home about 1030 in the evening. So a long day. But thanks so much to the Grolier Club for welcoming us. Yeah, it was lovely. We have an upcoming jaunt. That's another joint jaunt. Yes. On August 2nd, we're going to be going up to Porter Square Books their location in Cambridge, to see Laura Sims, who wrote, How Can I Help You? She's going to be there in conversation with Paul Tremblay. And his newest book is called The Beast You Are. Yeah, and I have a copy of his earlier book, A Head Full of Ghosts, which is actually on one of my reading challenges, the TBR challenge, I think it is, that Adam does. So I'm going to see about trying to read it before we go. I don't know if that's going to be possible or not. And if you want to join us, that's at seven o'clock at Porter Square Books. And this location is in Cambridge and it's in a mall. So there's yes, plenty of parking. Plenty of parking, at least from what Google Earth showed us. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 25 White Street in Cambridge. Oh. Yeah, I think I'm going to have that Biblio Adventure. And then I'm going to have my butt on a lawn chair reading for the rest of August. Right on. We'll see. Yeah. Well, no, because we're going to have a Biblio Adventure to Salem. Oh, right. More to come on that. Yeah. Keep checking bookcougars.com forward slash Scarlet Summer 2023 because we will be updating that with Biblio Adventures, including a watch along of a Scarlet Letter movie. Yes. Can't wait for that. Yeah. So what about upcoming reads in that lawn chair? Yeah. Upcoming reads. the, The big one drum roll, as I mentioned earlier, is The Divine Comedy by Dante. I have wanted to read this book for a very long time, like since I was an undergraduate, probably. Um, You know, he came up, I was really into medieval literature, and also medieval art. He came up in both of those types of classes quite a lot. And I know I read sections here and there of it. Did The Divine Comedy, it's one of the most influential poems in the world. It is an amazing feat of literature. It was just so influential. When we were at the Old Man's, there was a little bust of Dante. He was situated on a doily. (laughs) So I have a hashtag going, Dante on a doily. If you want to follow that and read along, Colleen is reading along with me. We're doing a buddy read. Anyone is welcome. I'm going to be reading the translation by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, because he was the first American to translate it. And he's also a very famous poet in the 19th century. And as a 19th century buff, I want to read it for that reason. And then I also heard it's still a very good translation. Uh, Longfellow knew Italian. He was also a poet. So he kept the spirit of the original Italian poem in mind. And then related to that, I plan on rereading The Dante Club by Matthew Pearl which is set in the 1860s when Longfellow was translating, I think just the Inferno, because there are three different parts within the Divine Comedy, the Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradiso. In the Dante Club, this novel, this mystery novel, it involves Longfellow and other 19th century authors, but murders start happening. One of the big takeaways from this book that I remember was a Civil War soldier who basically had PTSD before people understood PTSD, 
or thought it was just the World War One soldiers who were the first to be affected by PTSD, you know, and they called it shell shock. So it goes back to very ancient times, but I appreciated it being included. So Dante, I'm going to start this August 1st, and I plan to do a pretty swift read. And that's the day this episode drops. So reminder that we're also both going to be reading Hester by Lori Lico Albanez. Please join us. There is a thread on Goodreads if you want to join the conversation there. I'm also looking for a copy of Small Fires, an Epic in the Kitchen. This is by Rebecca Mae Johnson. This came out in the UK a while ago, and now it's here, and I didn't see it in the bookstore yesterday. I'm looking for it. It's a hot pink cover with this apron that's kind of got like flames on it. So I need to get my hands on a copy of it. It's a memoir that people in the food world are talking about. So it has my curiosity peaked. We also want to remind people that The Invisible Hour by Alice Hoffman is publishing on August 15th, right around the corner. Pre-order it. You can go to our bookshop.org page and we have it there for you to find and order if you'd like. Also tell your library about it if you haven't already, including the audiobook. Right. You yeah. Know, and get yourself on the hold list. You know, maybe right. you can be first on that yes, list. Yes, exactly. Coming up next is our conversation with Allie Frank and Asha Yeomans about their new novel, The Better Half, which just came out. It's about Nina, who's a 43-year-old black woman who's the head of a school, like a private swanky high school. In Seattle. In Seattle. And before the school year starts, she goes to have a last hurrah weekend with her girlfriend and meets a man. And it changes everything for her future. There's a lot to this novel. One of the things that Ali and Asha talked to us about is they seem to come up with ideas for books. And then as soon as the book is about to come out, these things show up in the real world. (laughs) So this book is no different, including the idea of affirmative action, which just as this book was coming out, the Supreme Court in the United States made a very important decision around. So... They talk a lot about all of that and about being a writing duo, which is a first for us. We've never interviewed a writing duo. So that was a lot of fun. Totally a lot of fun to hear about how they work together. So enjoy. We are thrilled to be talking today with not one, but two authors, the writing team of Ali Frank and Asha Yeomans. Ali and Asha hail from the Pacific Northwest and were co-workers who discovered they were literary soulmates. They have both worked in public and private schools one as an administrator, and one as a teacher. Between them, they have two dogs, two husbands, three books, and four children. Their three novels are Tiny Imperfections, which was about desperate parents and their ill-fated misbehavior, Never Meant to Meet You, which explores common ground between the Black and Jewish experiences, and their new release, The Better Half, which was just published on July 1st by Mindy's Book Studio, an Amazon imprint. Mindy Kaling called The Better Half charming, laugh-out-loud funny, and honest. The Better Half celebrates the absurdity and joy in life and does so with an enviable grace and good heart. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we thought just for the listener's sake, we would have you each briefly introduce yourselves so they could get used to your voices. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having us here, Chris and Emily. My name's Asha Yeomans, and I live in Seattle, Washington with my husband and two boys. Both of them are adults, so they're out of the house. Along with my co-writer, who you'll hear from next, I'm a full-time author, very passionate home cook. You're also an amazing caretaker of your whole family, nuclear and extended, Asha. Yesterday, I cooked four pounds of potatoes, two pounds of bacon, a whole sleeve of bread, fruit, gallon of Kool-Aid, Yeah, it was a busy breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we should say we're recording right after July 4th. So that must have been a picnic. (laughs) Wow. I'm Allie Frank and Asha is my professional better half. And then I have my own better half, my husband, Scott, and two girls, one in middle school, one in high school, and the most adorable mini Bernie Doodle dog that I love to death, although had never had a dog, never wanted a dog. And now I'm the biggest sucker for a dog. <laughs> um, see, middle life, you can always grow and change and 
in the middle days of your life. And Ash and I lived together uh, for over a decade in Seattle, but I now live in Sun Valley, Idaho. Oh, wow. That's yeah. interesting. So you can't write in the same room anymore. You would be amazed how much we see each other. <laughs> we really made a commitment, probably what, Ash, you think every six weeks we're side by side? Yeah, from here to Sun Valley, it's just a short commute. So we okay. jump on a plane, we work together. I spend the night at Allie's beautiful home in Sun Valley. We put on our matching PJs. And uh, <laughs> she's not joking. We have matching PJs. That's awesome. <laughs> and and in those times, we can really work from morning to night because uh, we're together the whole time. Um, and she comes to visit me too. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Cool. Well, that's kind of one of the questions we had. In your acknowledgments, you mentioned how writing is such an intimate act. But here you are doing it together. And so that's a question we had was, how do you write together? And so you've started answering that a little bit more. Could you talk about the details of how you actually manage to write together? Sure. Allie and I both have strengths and weaknesses. And it just so happens that we kind of fit like a puzzle with those things. The things that I'm really good at, Allie may struggle with and vice versa. So that's luck bringing us together with those, you know, like, like finding a good spouse, somebody that you, you just fit with and they can pick up the load when you drop it. Allie has this amazing ability to craft a story. I mean, she is the one that leads us down the path to what the story is going to be about after we initially outline it together verbally and talk about what we think is going to happen. And she'll get started on the first few chapters. She always says they're really ugly, but I just don't think that she knows what a brilliant writer she is. Mm -hmm. So she sends me the rough first three chapters or so. And then I go in with more depth, the emotion, the voice of the characters, the dialogue, what they're thinking. So we kind of say, I'm the skin and she's the bone. (laughs) (laughs) And you can't go nowhere without either one of those things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so we do, we leapfrog back and forth like that. I write three chapters, send them to Asha. She works on those three. I write the next three. And that's our step to just get the book down. You know, not pretty, not any place near, you know, ready to send to our editors, but down. And then that's when I'm going to Seattle. She's coming here and we're sitting by each other and probably six to eight times Before the manuscript even goes to our editor, we sit next to each other and Asha has a phenomenal ability to act out our stories. And we read every word, every sentence, every punctuation through the whole book. We do it once, then we do it twice, then we do it three times. And we have made the commitment to one another that we have to agree on absolutely everything. It's not that I write the white parts, Asha writes the black parts. Asha is a greater proliferator on all things black or for me, all three things Jewish. We have to come to agreement because we have such a mixture and mashup of characters that we have to be able to defend and love and support everything in our books out in the world. And we also have the commitment that we write from the human experience first, and then comes race and religion and gender and all those lovely specificities. But first is the human experience. And that's why we've chosen to write in one voice and always will in our books, rather than divide the two voices up between the two of us. Oh, that's fascinating. How did you discover that you were literary soulmates? How did you first start writing together? (laughs) Well, we worked together for many years at a small private school in Seattle where all four of our children attended. And Allie was assistant head of school and I was the pre-K teacher and I had the classroom right below her office. She would visit often to my pre-K class. But on Saturdays, we had admissions and we were both on that team. We had a very brilliant head of school who made sure that when we're in discussions as a group, we talked about the children and their families and we really gave each child the attention 
that they deserved. And Allie and I would creep downstairs afterwards into the kitchen of my classroom. And inevitably, Allie would grab something that we cooked that day out of the fridge. And we would laugh about the funny things the kids said and did, the worries that the parents had, the questions about getting into Harvard when their children were three. Um, Those things made us laugh. And we discovered we shared the same sense of humor. We found we were humor soulmates. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that Asha was good at writing about kids and families and schools because I would read all the narrative report cards of all the teachers before they would go out. So that was my sole entree into Asha's writing. Asha's entree into my writing were emails that I sent out to all the teachers. And that's... Lots of emails. (laughs) (laughs) And that's about as much as we knew of each other's writing. Asha left the school first to go on to start uh, a catering company with her sister, I left to co-found a new school, but we always kept in touch. And to make a sort of long story short, after a couple of years, I had this idea about a protagonist for a book that became Tiny Imperfections. And I called Asha up to see if she would want to join me to do it. And we are the true example of the cliche, ignorance is bliss. (laughs) Because we met, we met for coffee, we committed to give it a try. And 14 months later, we sold Tiny Imperfections to Penguin Random House. So we didn't really know we were literary soulmates, especially because we have very vastly different reading interests. But we have the exact same work ethic. And ultimately, that's what we really attribute it to is that our commitment to our stories and our characters and to each other is profoundly similar. And that has been, I think, the frosting on the cake the whole time. So many questions. Oh, Oh, my goodness. Well, (laughs) we have a list of questions, but I'm going to ask you one just based on what you just said. Tell us about your road to publishing, because all three of the books are published with different houses, correct? Um, Sort of with two and three. So Mindy Kaling's book studio is with Amazon Publishing. It's a new imprint. So we were already at Montlake as an imprint of Amazon Publishing Mm. and with the most generous editor possible. And she recognized with us that um, our book going to Mindy Book Studios was a great opportunity and she championed for that to happen. So different imprints, but same major publisher for book two and three. So how did you reach out to Random House or find Random House for Tiny Imperfections? Well, we have a tenacious and loving and found family member in our agent. And she is like a dog with a bone. She's not going to let it go. And she really believed in us. So she's the one who sold us to Penguin Random House initially. Before we were, Tiny Imperfections was published and we were sort of shopping it around You know, we did hear from publishers that they weren't sure about us, what category to put us in. Our book is technically rom-com, but we like to say it's (laughs) com-rom because we lead with the funny. And we have characters that lead full lives and have all sorts of types of loves, but they just make a little room for romantic love. And that's fine, too. But um, our protagonists are very strong and complete women before they meet their love interest in our books. Some publishers, you know, thought, well, we don't know how to sell this, this writing team. We're not sure what our readers will think about Allie writing this book with you. Mm, People might not think that you wrote it, that Allie's taking advantage of you because the character is black in the book and just using your name for cachet. And if anybody knows me, I, I mean, who would take advantage of me? It's not possible. Um, Small but mighty, well, right, Asha? Absolutely. <laughs> Short and scary. That's what I say. <laughs> so we moved on. If publishers came to us with any kind of doubt, of, especially about our partnership, we knew they weren't right for us. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing that we want to really 
show to the world is just how you can collaborate personally, intimately, and deeply with someone who has a different background than you, someone that looks different than you, someone that is different from you, and you can make it work. So if anybody came to us with doubts, we just knew they weren't for us. And Penguin Random House believed in us. So we believed in ourselves too and went with them. That's great. It's great to hear. I'll continue the story because it is, it has been an interesting journey because we thought with our first book that Tiny Imperfections was a great book, but Ash and I were a really interesting story as well. And it never crossed our mind that we would be considered a media liability. And that's what some of the other publishers thought of us, Mm. um, sort of a la James Gray and a million little pieces. So they loved our book, but they backed away from us. And that was surprising. And I would say an eye-opening and learning experience because we thought we were fabulous. (laughs) then when random house came out with tiny imperfections and it was may of 2020 it was covid it was a dark time in our country for what was going on between clashes between police and people of color and all of a sudden the publishing houses were all putting out major statements in support of diverse stories more diverse authors also super important, more diverse staff that work in the publishing industry. When we were at Penguin Random House, there was not one person of color on our whole team making decisions about a book with a protagonist of person of color. But yet again, Asha and I thought that we had it made. We were already in a big five publishing house. We were an interesting take on diversity. We wrote stories of diverse characters. And in the same time that those statements came out to the world from the publishing houses, Penguin Random House let us go, Mm. which was very surprising to us. But, you know, things happen behind doors as well as in front of doors. And we still persevered and we wrote Never Meant to Meet You and, you know, Out of the Ashes often comes beauty. And we really ended up where we're supposed to be. Like we said earlier, we adore our editor at Montlake at Amazon Publishing. And we feel really a part of the marketing team, the PR team, the design team that our voices matter. So we ended up where we're supposed to be, but it definitely had highs and lows to get there. Mm-hmm. So in your acknowledgments, you talk about how you have a propensity for writing topical books that coincide with social and cultural shifts in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about the different things that you've explored? And then I'm hoping we can drill down to some things that have happened recently in our country, too, that are prescient for the better half. Well, I'm going to start with I really feel like Allie should play the state lotto a lot more. (laughs) She has some sort of ESP. I'm not quite sure how she does it. But when we start a book, inevitably, you turn on the news a couple months later, and they're talking about what we're already writing about. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna get this one to the person that is behind that propensity. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, we're not going to get all like, woo, woo, crazy higher powers here. But We literally got Tiny Imperfections down, like practically typed the end and, you know, had developed this whole story around an admission scandal and immediately following typing the end, the whole varsity blues and the paying for college acceptances all erupted. I mean, it was just this bizarre timing of it. So that kind of was shocking and interesting and surprising. And then when Ash and I wrote Never Meant to Meet You, it was during COVID. And, you know, usually writers take in their observations in life to inform their writing, but there weren't many observations in life. So, you know, we really started spinning this tale that's funny and humorous and modern but really is a mirror to the Black and Jewish experience in the United States. And as we were 
sort of finishing up that book, then the rise in anti-Semitism in this country exploded. So on January 6th, you know, there are people storming the Capitol and T-shirts that said six million wasn't enough. And there were things going on in the Black community and then a coming together of both. The Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance started. So we just thought, this is so bizarre. We literally just wrote a book about this historical alliance. And then there's this coming together of it out within our country as well. And then with the better half as well, we got the very basics of the book down and right as it was down was really when the, I think, reality of what was probably truly going to happen with Roe v. Wade came to the forefront. There had been rumblings and we weren't reacting to those rumblings because at least for Asha and I were like, oh, this is never going to happen. But right when we finished The Better Half, what should have been fiction seemed to become more and more looking like fact. And then I just have to say, because I called Asha, was it yesterday, Asha? Craziness. So we just turned in our fourth manuscript today. So it's down on paper. And in this book, we explore a Catholic school called St. Anne. And two days ago in the New York Times was an article about a lawsuit at a Catholic school in New York called St. Anne. Oh, my. (laughs) Which is like, how how does this keep happening? Wow. Can I put in a request for your next manuscript? (laughs) Sure. What do you want to say? What would you like this? Well, let me just say, we're not sure when we write about it, anything gets better. (laughs) Yeah, I need to think hard on that. Yeah, yeah, we'll think... (laughs) We wanted to ask you about the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action that just took place, because I feel like the better half does have a story arc about students and, well, I should say administrators not being too generous necessarily with how they treat students with race and athleticism and, you know, all of that. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, You know, I think that this is part of that big pendulum that swings in our country back and forth on issues. You know, um, affirmative action began to balance out schools, especially the Ivy League, because they felt there were too many Jewish students. So, you know, it's it's now swung back. And I think it's going to hopefully swing back to the middle again as mm-hmm. well. It's just so complex, this issue. Yeah. Um, but we do address a small portion of it in the better half. Mm-hmm. And that is how students of color either benefit or fail from programs that open the door widely, maybe without considering the fact that this might not be the good thing for the student. Right. And I think that any institution, any institution from the Ivy Leagues to the garbage truck drivers union and all in between and and below and above, whatever you think, they all need to be diverse to be excellent institutions. That's the only way to really test your excellence is it should be a mirror of this country and how that happens may vary from institution to institution. But it's great to be part of keeping that conversation going through our writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you did a really good job with that in the better half. It surprised me in many ways <laughs> to the very end. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny you bring that up because I actually hadn't really thought about, we have been so focused on the Roe v. Wade decision and how, you know, so much of the conversation about abortion and access to it cycles around young, single women, disenfranchised women. And we were exploring that you can be a woman in middle life and be very secure in your foundation of who you are and what you have. And still, you should have that choice. That was really our kind of current focus that I hadn't really thought recently about the twins and the affirmative action. I think probably because I've been so focused towards higher education, although the effects of it absolutely trickle down. 
Right. Thank you for bringing that up to us as well. Sure. Or as Asha says, you know, the parents of three-year-olds who are already planning the path forward for their kids to get into Harvard, you know, it's yep. <laughs> no pressure there. True question. I got one. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and to follow up on what you just said, I mean, I don't have the statistics, but I know they say that the percentage of women who are actually seek abortions the largest percentage tend to be women who already have children and are well into their lives and just know the work of raising a child and want to make a choice about whether they have another one, you know, important for us to remember that. And I think that having a protagonist in this novel that was 43 and having to make some choices around that really helps. It was also important for us to have in there that she didn't really try to seek some sort of reason you know, this will be my reason. It was just a choice she needed to make in her own mind. Mm -hmm. She didn't give excuses or explanations about her life. I think it's very important to discuss the fact that women often are questioned when they make decisions, that they need reasons for the things that they do. And when it comes to body autonomy, she doesn't need a reason to decide what to do with her own body. And it's just a choice of her heart and mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. very well said. So I'm the one that reads all the reviews, good, bad, and <laughs> everywhere in between. Not, Asha, not so much. But interestingly enough, a few of our less good uh, reviews, there have been three of them from men who just didn't buy that a woman at 43 could accidentally get pregnant and not know she was pregnant. And all I could think to myself is, these men need a big course on perimenopause and <laughs> menopause. Yeah. Like they, and they were angry. Like, this is just not plausible. She wouldn't know. I'm like, have any of you been a, you know, mid 40 year old woman? Right. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. But even in our reviews there, you know, are men claiming that the claims that our protagonists were making couldn't possibly be right or accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a nosy question. You just mentioned <laughs> you just mentioned reading reviews. Earlier you both mentioned reading having very different reading tastes. We're curious about what are your reading tastes? Oh boy. Since I was a kid, I was a super big comics nerd. Loved my comic nerd status. Shout out to all the comic nerds out there. Marvel and DC and the X-Men and the Avengers. And that led to a love of sci-fi and paranormal romance, urban fiction, anything with ghouls and goblins and vampires. And if they fall in love with werewolves, oh my goodness, that's <laughs> my jam. <laughs> you and Chris. <laughs> yes. Oh, we will have to exchange some book lists then because I'm a little behind from writing so much. So behind in some of my series. And I read series. Oh, okay. Lots and lots of series. And um, I mean, you know, 20 books in them. And um, Allie, not so much. What do you read? What do you read, Allie? So everything that Asha just mentioned, I've never read one. <laughs> <laughs> the closest I've ever come to reading a series was Jojo Moy's follow-up to me before you. I think that's the close. I did read all three of those. Um, but those weren't intentional series. <laughs> uh, so when we're in the midst of writing our story, I read memoir and biography and nonfiction because I need to read something wholly different than what we're writing. And then when we're in sort of development phase of a story, I will read a lot of women's fiction that would be comps to our books. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. Oh, very different. Yeah. And whenever I give a book recommendation to Ostra or vice versa, we both nod and smile and know the other's never going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't give up. <laughs> you still keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that Chris and I talk about with the podcast is that by talking about a book that we've read, it almost makes you feel good. Like, oh, okay, I don't have to read that mm -hmm. because you read it. We all have toppling TBR piles. It's good oh, to yeah. have a right-hand woman split that work. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Vicarious reading. <laughs> 
So one question that we had about the better half is that there are these incredibly strong female characters, Nina, her BFF, Marisol, but there's also this wonderful father-daughter relationship. What made you want to put a father-daughter relationship into this novel? Oh, Ash, I'll let you start on that one. (laughs) We are both, I think, uh, what people might call daddy's girls. But more than that, um, our fathers both were so involved with our lives um, as young kids. Our mothers are great too, but the dads for me and Allie really, really boosted us up and made us feel like we could do anything in the world. I went everywhere with my dad. He was a political figure here in Seattle, strong reputation in education here and a lasting legacy and memory in the city. And my mom wasn't much of a political wife. She didn't want to go to those gatherings and hear all those women talk about your father. (laughs) So wonderful. They don't have to pick up his socks. So I would go with him. There'd inevitably be a buffet there. So (laughs) I will join you. And I got to watch at his elbow just how he connected with people from so many different lifestyles walks of life. He could talk to somebody on the street corner all the way up to the president, which he did when President Obama honored him in 2012 for his work in education. And I enjoyed learning that lesson from him. So putting Fitzroy in this book as sort of Nina's advice source, source of support, someone to lean on, mirrors how I felt with my dad when he was alive. So, um, yeah. Mm. Lovely. And I would add, I'm fortunate that my dad is still alive and super active and amazing, amazing individual and has now adopted Asha. Um, I love him. I might like her more. It's, a, it's all on debate. <laughs> Allie's father is my dude. That's my dude. <laughs> With each book, you know, you want a new um, challenge. And Asha and I were very cognizant of for the better half um having quite a few male characters in the book our first two books are um pretty female heavy and we wanted to explore can we write men and can we write you know a father of one generation then we have our you know 20 year old male coming into his professional self. And then we have the twins, we have high school boys, um, and we have a male head of school, so, or excuse me, head of the board. So that was also very intentional challenge on our behalf to see if we could write male characters as strongly as women. And we definitely both fell in love with Fitzroy for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, he's a great character. Can we ask one last burning question or do you have a burning Absolutely. question or can I ask? No, go it? For okay. it. Yeah. So when you guys are together and you're in your matching jammies and um, Ali is a professed non cook and Asha is a professed cook. Asha, do you have favorite things that you cook for Ali? Oh, yes. Yes. Every time she's here in Seattle or if I go down and see her, I try my very best to make a baked macaroni and cheese. Mm-hmm. This time around, I had 15 bean soup over rice that Allie enjoyed. Mm. So yes, I love it. And that's part of the reason we have so much food in all three of our books. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Human beings are the only species that cook and share food together. And that seems an important detail on this planet with all the species that we're among. I really believe that connections can be made across a dining room table sitting around a campfire and sharing hot dogs and s'mores. Connecting through food is comforting. And I think it makes it more possible when you're breaking bread together. And we'd love to eat. Yeah, but I also but I also want to say, just so I don't want anyone to think that Asha is special cooking, but we now are so close that I just go in her fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever's there. <laughs> I eat. So it's not this very formal Asha saying like, oh, you're coming over, Ali. What would you like? No. I mean, I just break right in. <laughs> oh, yeah. She knows, she knows there's leftovers in my fridge. Yeah. All the time there's yeah. something to eat. Just warm it up. 
Nice. nice. I call those refrigerator friends. The ones you don't, you know, like you don't have to worry about hosting. You just say, you know, like have at it. Yeah. 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 Nice. <laughs> Lovely. Well, we're so glad that you took the time to stop by and chat with us today. Congratulations on launching your third book and finishing your fourth manuscript. Yes. That's amazing. Good yeah. for you. We're a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> Big deep breath. Yeah. Big deep breath. <laughs> Good. Well, hopefully you get some time off this summer. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.